On May 30, 1967, a flash message was received at the Pentagon. General Vo Nu Yen Zop, the commander in chief of the North Vietnamese Army, had been located by Signals Intelligence. Zop was the architect of the 1954 French defeat at Dien Bien Phu. He was Ho Chi Minh's most trusted advisor and hero to the North Vietnamese people. The information was given to an intelligence analyst team and they spent the next two hours going over hundreds of translated radio messages. Finally, they agreed that the data was confirmed by multiple sources. By noon they were briefing General Earl Wheeler, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Zop was believed to be in Laos, inspecting Binh Tram 34, a regimental headquarters of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. By the spring of 1967, the workings of the Laotian logistics system, including unit locations and commander biographies, were well known to U.S. intelligence. This information was held at the highest levels because it ran counter to the narrative of success being presented to the public. No longer relying on bicycles and porters to move their supplies, North Vietnamese Army truck convoys were now moving on roads that had been built throughout the difficult mountain terrain, camouflaged by the thick jungle to avoid air attack. Military equipment that arrived in North Vietnam by rail from China, or by sea from the port of Haiphong, were moved into Laos over the Ma Gia Pass and Ban Karai Pass. A natural choke point occurred at a river crossing called the Ban La Boy Ford. It was the subject of continuous bombing. Less than 20 miles north of the demilitarized zone, North Vietnamese troops entered Laos through the Ban Raving Pass. Captured by the People's Army in 1958, Chapone was the headquarters of the 559th Transportation Group, a core size unit that controlled the entire logistical system. It was well protected by anti-aircraft. 40 miles south was Binh Tram 34. A forward operations center consisting of large storage and maintenance facilities dug into the mountains. The importance of Binh Tram 34 could not be overstated. From here supplies and manpower moved east to the Ashao Valley, to reinforce their troops fighting in Accor. General Wheeler could have easily arranged a bombing mission through the Air Force chain of command, but given the importance of the target he felt obligated to inform Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense. McNamara quickly agreed to the airstrike. The war in Vietnam had become a slog. The military seemed to be making little progress, and the American people were becoming frustrated. The killing of Zop would deal a heavy blow to the North Vietnamese, and at the same time allow the administration to celebrate a much-needed victory. In fact, the operation of successful could be a turning point in the war. McNamara conferred with President Lyndon Johnson. When he got back to Wheeler, he added the requirement that after the airstrike, a bomb damage assessment be made by ground troops. If they were successful, the administration wanted proof to show the world. Since Laos was a neutral country, he suggested an all-Vietnamese unit be employed. Wheeler flat out rejected that, saying that it would be impossible to maintain security if their South Vietnamese allies were informed. The only American military unit, authorized to operate on the ground in Laos was Op Plan 35. Op Plan 35 was organized under the deceptive administrative title, the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, Studies and Observations Group. Better known as MACVSOG. The top secret unit was in fact not in the MACV chain of command, but was controlled by the Special Activities Directorate, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It had been a fast boat unit from MACVSOG, that in 1964, had successfully lured the North Vietnamese Navy into the Gulf of Tonkin incident. In late 1965, SOG had begun running small unit operations in Laos, made up of American Special Forces volunteers and indigenous mercenary fighters. Wheeler expressed confidence that SOG was up to the task. His only reservation was that if the mission results were made public, the highly classified organization would be exposed. McNamara dismissed his objection, and reiterated that the mission of the Bomb Damage Assessment Unit was to locate General Zop. If he had not been killed by the airstrike, their mission was to kill or capture him. Wheeler assured him the instructions were clear. With that McNamara said. The President of the United States directs the operation to be completed, on or before 5 June. General Depew issued the order. In a nondescript five-story building on Pasteur Street Saigon, Colonel John Singlob, the commander of SOG, received it in the early morning hours of 1 June. Singlob was the perfect man to run the top-secret organization. He had parachuted into France with the OSS during World War II, and headed CIA operations in post-war Manchuria. He instinctively knew that a mission of this magnitude would have field grade officers seeing stars, so he gave the mission to forward operating base 1 at Fubai, much as any normal mission, without undue oversight from SOG headquarters. At FOB-1, a two-platoon hatchet force was quickly readied, and coordination with the Air Force and Marine air support assets were completed. 
Marine and Air Force commanders were ordered from the highest level that there were to be no delays or substitution of the requested assets. A problem that had plagued previous SOG operations. During the afternoon of 1 June, the Hatchet Force geared up. It was an in and out mission, so they substituted rations with additional ammunition. Late the next morning, the assault unit, consisting of approximately 50 Nung Special Commandos, and four American Special Forces sergeants were airlifted to FOB 3 at the Marine Quezon Combat Base. There they were briefed on the mission. The target area in Laos had been designated Oscar 8. When asked about the enemy strength, the briefers stated it was unknown, as was the norm for SOG operations. It was however pointed out that the enemy's combat effectiveness would be greatly degraded by the airstrike. To say the sergeants were skeptical, was an understatement. At first light the next morning, the commandos received their final inspection and loaded onto the transports. Shortly they were airborne. Covey their forward air controller, was already in place southwest of the target area. At exactly 0630 hours, a wave of 9 B-52 bombers dropped 250 tons of bombs on Oscar 8. A massive amount of ordnance for such a small target. Washington was clearly taking the mission very seriously. The commandos were nearing the target. Covey flew in low to inspect the damage and saw a large number of enemies swarming the area. Ground fire quickly drove them away. Urgently they radioed to abort the insertion. It was too late. The commandos were inbound. Both troop transports were shot down as they attempted to land. As was an H-34 search and rescue chopper. The hatchet force quickly moved the air crews and wounded to the safety of the freshly made bomb craters. They had too much concentrated firepower for the enemy to attack. Completely surrounded and taking sporadic fire, they tended the wounded. Any thought of finding the general vanished. Their mission was now to direct airstrikes to eliminate the anti-aircraft threat, and create a safe landing zone so they could be extracted. F-4 Phantom Jets and A-1E Sky Raiders worked napalm and cannon fire to eliminate the enemy positions on the bowl-shaped ridge to the north. A Phantom and an A-1E were shot down. The pilots of the Phantom ejected and were rescued. The A-1E pilot was killed. Finally, a transport was able to land and start the evacuation. The commandos struggled to load the wounded as the crew urged them to hurry. After several minutes they lifted off. At 100 feet the helicopter was hit by ground fire. The pilot struggled to keep it airborne, then crashed 300 meters north of the LZ. The enemy viciously raked the downed aircraft with small arms fire, then moved in, taking the survivors prisoner. One gravely wounded Special Forces soldier was searched by the enemy. They took his weapon and left him in place. Perhaps to set a trap for a rescue bird, or maybe they just expected him to die. By noon the situation for the assault force was dire. Three helicopters were lost in the initial insertion. What was left of the ground force is holding their own against light enemy resistance in two bomb craters. Two attack aircraft have been shot down, and an evacuation helicopter has crashed, with all aboard being killed or captured. Enemy casualties are unknown, but their protective ring of 51 caliber anti-aircraft batteries, on the ridgeline was intact. For the remainder of the day, Hillsboro, the Airborne Command and Control Center, repurposed aircraft from their missions in Vietnam to attack the anti-aircraft gun positions on the ridge line north of the troops. Without direction of Vietnamese King B braved heavy small arms fire, and successfully retrieved the crew of the search and rescue chopper that had been shot down during the insertion. By dusk, enemy fire had stopped and the battle area fell silent. As night fell, the wounded Special Forces soldier, left behind by the enemy, crawled off into the jungle. He would survive and be rescued several days later. The next day, what was left of the hatchet force, was extracted. Not a shot was fired. Not a shot was fired. Sometimes in combat, you and the enemy have the same goal. Our guys wanted to get out and the NVA wanted us out, so they held their fire. When you think about it, it kind of sums up the whole war. This operation happened less than a year before I got there. It was costly, 
Sog lost two sergeants. They thought they lost three, but then the third crawled out of the jungle. Over half the Nung mercenaries were lost. An A1E pilot was killed. Three of the crew of the Marine Extraction Chinook were either killed on the spot or in captivity. The Lance Corporal door gunner showed up in the 1973 POW release. Everybody thought he had been dead for years. It's no surprise that an H-34 helicopter was lost. We called them King Bees. They were flown by the South Vietnamese. Those guys were always getting shot down. It's also no surprise that another King Bee disobeyed orders and flew in to rescue the crew while the North Vietnamese were trying to turn the thing into a screen door. They were crazy. They had total disregard for wrecking helicopters. They'd be like, Finny Helicop, get new helicop. Most of us have stories about being on a hot LZ and Covey is telling us there's too much ground fire for the extraction. And he'd hear, King B, go. And they'd drop in and pick you up. A lot of people say SOG guys were the bravest men they ever knew. We'll tell you, King B pilots were the bravest men we ever knew. Oscar 8 was a disaster. Sending 50, 60 men into a regimental headquarters, even after a B-52 strike, doesn't make much sense. They knew it was a regimental headquarters, What'd they think, the commanding general of the entire North Vietnamese army was having lunch with a platoon? Declassified documents show that the CIA even knew the 10th Vietnamese Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion was there. Maybe the CIA and the Joint Chiefs of Staff weren't speaking at the time. As far as lessons learned, SOG ground operators were starting to figure out that if anyone above the grade of our operations officer got involved in a mission, we were in big trouble. Back at the Special Activities Directorate, they didn't learn anything. They never learned anything. The beautiful thing about classified missions is you just stick the after-action report in a file cabinet marked Top Secret and figure nobody will read it until after you retire. SOG wasn't done with Oscar 8. Not by a long shot. They'd keep trying to get teams in there for the next four years. I even got my turn. I'll make a video about it. Were they ever successful? No, they just kept losing people in helicopters. You'll find my book Dawson's War worthwhile. Rather than just accounts of this mission and that mission, I take you with three Americans and two Brew Mountain tribesmen as they spend a year running SOG operations. You're going to enjoy being in their company and get a real feel for what it was like. The book has over 400 five-star ratings on Amazon, a feat Amazon says only happens with one out of every 2,000 self-published books. As always, hit the like and subscribe buttons and ring the bell to watch my future videos. Hit the super thanks button. I promise I'll have a drink in your honor. Thanks for watching.